Good morning, and thank you for joining the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom's Conversation on Religious Freedom in Algeria. My name is Dwight Bashir, and I'm Director of Outreach and Policy at USURF. For those not familiar, USURF is an independent, bipartisan U.S. federal government body created by the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, or IRFA, to monitor religious freedom abroad and to make policy recommendations to the President, Secretary of State, and Congress. Our work is led by nine commissioners appointed by the President and the leadership of both political parties in the House of Representatives and the Senate, and is supported by a professional staff of about 20. Every year we release an annual report documenting religious freedom violations in countries that USURF recommends the State Department either designate as a country of particular concern or CPC or include on its special watch list. We also regularly publish country specific and thematic reports on issues relevant to religious freedom. Today's discussion will focus on conditions in Algeria, a country that USURF has monitored for years. However, in our most recent 2020 annual report, we recommended for the first time ever that Algeria be included on the State Department's special watch list for engaging in or tolerating severe religious freedom violations that met two of the elements of IRFA's systematic, ongoing, and egregious standard. We noted that in 2019, Algeria escalated its ongoing repression of religious minorities including by systematically cracking down on the evangelical Protestant community. I'm joined today by two of our commissioners, Vice Chair Anarima Bargava and Commissioner Johnny Moore. We are also joined by two expert panelists, Jeff King, who is president of International Christian Concern, and Dalia Ghanem, resident scholar at the Malcolm Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut, Lebanon. Today's event will begin with opening remarks from Vice Chair Bargaba, who will focus on recent political developments and provide a general background on religious freedom conditions. And then Commissioner Moore will delve into the latest on the challenges facing the Christian community. Then we'll hear from Jeff King, followed by Dahlia Ghanem. Afterwards, I'll moderate a brief conversation among the speakers with a couple of opening questions. And then following that, there'll be time for some questions from the audience. Now to ask a question, please use the Zoom webinar's Q&A function at the bottom center of your screen to submit your question in writing, which you can do at any time during the event starting now. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Vice Chair Bargaba. Thank you, Dwight, and thanks and welcome to all who have joined us here today, including our distinguished panelists, Jeff and Dahlia, uh, for this important discussion. As Dwight mentioned, in 2020, for the first time, USURF recommended that the State Department include Algeria on its special watch list for engaging in or tolerating severe violations of international religious freedom. The Algerian government routinely discriminates against religious minorities, including Christians, Jews, and minority Muslim communities who do not conform to mainstream Sunni Islam, such as the Shia and Ahmadi Muslims. Often, asserting that they are not Muslim. In addition to placing specific restrictions on these communities, the government also exerts control over religious practice by the Sunni Muslim majority. The government directly hires and trains imams and places speech, speech restrictions on religious leaders. Under the penal code, authorities may fine or imprison anyone who preaches in a mosque or other public place without being appointed or authorized, or anyone who preaches against the noble mission of the mosque to undermine social cohesion or who advocates for such preaching. Algeria also enforces anti-blasphemy laws, which can carry a sentence of up to five years in prison. These violations are happening in a context of broader social and political upheaval in Algeria that has the potential to either improve or continue to erode religious freedom conditions in the country. Last year, popular protests coupled with a military coup toppled the regime of then president Abdelaziz Bouteflika. Since that time, the Algerian people have been engaging with and at times battling remaining political elites to make their voices heard and ensure that their constitutionally and internationally guaranteed rights are held by whatever political system replaces the old regime. The new regime under President 
boom has done some actions for religious minorities and unfortunately has even escalated enforcement of Algerian laws that restrict non-Muslim communities. That is why it is so important that we have this discussion today. Just last week, Algeria recently held a constitutional referendum in an attempt to redefine the relationship between the state and its citizens and correct the flaws of previous regimes that have led to division and repression. The conversation on what the future of Algeria will look like is happening right now. And we need to ensure that respect for religion and freedom of religion and belief is a part of that discussion. In this context, I wanna turn it over to my colleague, Commissioner Johnny Moore, to discuss in more detail restrictions and discrimination against pro Protestant communities in Algeria in recent years. Uh, thank you uh, to uh, Vice Chair Bargava. And I, I wanna join you in thanking all of our fellow panelists and the audience that's watching uh, for this very timely, timely and uh, important prescient discussion, in fact. Uh, I, I also want to uh, take, take a moment to uh, offer my prayers uh, for the, the Algerian, Algerian president, Abdelmajid Taboun, uh, as he is recovering from COVID-19 uh, in, in Germany. Uh, I, 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 as we look at this entire world, knowing so many people infected by this disease, I, I think it's important for us uh, to, to take a moment to acknowledge that and to extend our blessings and prayers uh, for his full recovery. Uh, you know, over the past several years, uh, the Algerian government um, has apparently been in the process of systematically cracking down on the evangelical community in the country, uh, in, in particular through a series of church closures and even raids. Uh, th this includes two of the largest Protestant churches in the entire country. And uh, th this isn't the first time that we've seen this uh, in, in Algeria. We, we saw it in 2008. Uh, we, we saw it in 2011. Uh, it seems like we're in an ongoing second or third wave of this uh, that that uh, seems to have begun around May around November of 2017, and it's been worsening uh, of of late, in particular in 2019. But in October of this year, uh, of last year, three of the largest country churches in the country were closed, and a court decision upheld that just in August. So, so this is, when we're talking about an escalation in 2019, we're not, we're not talking about something a year ago, we're talking about something that a court has ruled on uh, very, very recently. Uh, in Algeria, of course, it, it's not just the evangelical community that is affected by these uh, unnecessary policies. It, it seems that non-Muslims across the board are facing more and more impediments. And on the basis of, a, of, a, of an ordinance passed in 2006, uh, ordinance 6-3, which pay, places unique limitations on non-Muslims and their freedom of speech uh, or freedom of religion and, and belief. It, it requires non-Muslims to register, uh, to report certain activities. All of that's done with the National Commission for Non-Muslim Religious Groups. You know, USERF, as, as a rule, we don't like registration. You know, it's, not, it's something we frown upon. It's something that we report on all over the world. But what's, what's even interesting in this case, which makes it even worse in our estimation, is that this commission, which is responsible for, for reviewing and offering permission for these types of religious activities, seems to hardly ever meet and hasn't issued any permits, to our knowledge, for any any churches, and, and in fact, several, several decrees have been issued uh, which have strengthened the responsibilities of this national commission. And they, those, the, the ordinance along with these, with these orders and the activities of the commission ha have resulted in the arrest and charge of individuals from everything from proselytism uh, to, to transporting uh, religious objects such as Bibles which is absurd. And so what, what seems to have been a, a, a periodic issue seems to be becoming more commonplace in Nigeria at this very delicate and important time uh, where, where changes, in fact, changes that seem to be uh, where the peer pressure is moving in the right direction in other parts of, of the Middle East. It seems like Algeria is having a regression 
uh, and it's very, very important that, that it stops. And when you add on top of that, uh, the effect of blasphemy laws that have been widely uh, enforced in recent years and uh, e even reports of uh, punishment for those who failed to fast on Ramadan, uh, th th this, is a, this is a very, very uh, tenuous time uh, for, for religious freedom in the country. It's why Yusuf is giving the attention to it that it is in, in a way that it has never given. Uh, to, to Algeria, and it's also time, there's also sufficient time for Algeria to reverse course and to take a different approach uh, to these issues. But one way of not doing it is what they just did in August, as I said, when uh, the, the court in the country upheld the governor's order to close three churches associated with the Protestant Evangelical Church. So we have lots of recommendations in, in our report, as we always do. Algeria is on our special watch list, as, we, as we've said. One of the first things that can happen immediately is U.S. Embassy officials in Algiers can immediately meet with uh, the Algerian government, starting with the Commission for Non-Muslim Religious Groups, to clarify and assess its process for reviewing and approving registration and permits for houses of worship and all the other related matters. Uh, and, and if the Algerian government wanted, wanted to be on the good side uh, of a country that, that, that is clearly uh, promoting religious freedom all around the world and wants to be in the direction of the momentum in the region that is moving in the direction of religious freedom in some profound circumstances, it needs to get its act together. Uh, and, the U and our own State Department ought to be more engaged in that. And it can start by as soon as next week scheduling a meeting uh, with, with their Algerian counterparts to, to shine a light on what's, what's going on. Uh, and to add to the conversation, uh, I'll, 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 I'll hand it off now to Jeff King, uh, who leads International Christian Concern. Well, thank you, Johnny. <clears throat> you know, uh, 18 years ago, I started with International Christian Concern. And within a couple of years, I got a call uh, from Algeria, from an Algerian pastor. And he was saying that uh, the evangelical pastors had been rounded up. And they said, look, we're going to close down your churches. We're going to fine you many thousands of dollars. And you're going to go into prison for three years. And uh, so I brought uh, a pastor over and we did an advocacy campaign and we visited the Hill and user and state, uh, IRF. And uh, <clears throat> so the pastor goes back and uh, about two weeks later, I get this email. He's like, you're not gonna believe it. He said, the same guys that rounded us up, brought us all back together and said, look, we know someone's been talking in Washington DC. We just want you to know that we're all family here. We're all Algerians. Uh, you don't need to go to ICE. You don't need to go to DC. You can just talk to us. There's no fines, no church closures, etc. Every the problem is wiped away. So afterwards, I was like, "Wow, that was easy," and uh, I didn't know advocacy was so easy. Everyone said it was so hard, and I thought, "Boy, I did a great job on that." Uh, but in my naivete and my myopia, I didn't realize. You know, it's like a lot of groups, just like now, we're working on this situation. And uh, there's real power in that. You know, last year, we received uh, more calls from the Algerian church and uh, everything has been detailed. It's the church closures, et cetera. And uh, so we did two tours on Capitol Hill. We got two member letters, uh, one of them stronger than the other, but we've got two member letters uh, and other groups working. But the Algerian government is more hardened this time around. Uh, two weeks ago, I had a two hour meeting with two top uh, pastors in Algeria, and we discussed the, the whole issue, and, and, um, and basically they're calling out for help. And, you know, the United States, we, we are the best hope for religious freedom, and USURF is the tip of the spear on this. Uh, we, we're not always seen this way, but we're looking, we're actually working for the good of these countries. Uh, we all know the benefits of religious freedom. Uh, but these countries, the beleaguered faith followers in these countries, they look to us, they look to the United States as their best hope, as their last hope. You know, looking back so many years ago to that advocacy campaign, I think my lesson, I didn't realize at the time, but the lesson was the power of the group versus the power of one. Um, and it, it's the power of our religious freedom community. You know, it's the power of USURF. It's uh, the NGOs, all the NGOs assembled and, that are watching and working on this. It's IRF, it's uh, at state, it's the members on the Hill. So uh, I just wanna to say today publicly, I so appreciate USERF's leadership and their courage on this issue. It's, 
it's so important. I'm humbled to work in partnership with all other NGOs on this issue. You know, ICC is a, a single drop of water, as are all the groups assembled here. But together, we are an ocean. And I would say, let's, let's send a wave of pressure to the, to the Algerian government uh, and, and noise too. Let's, let's uh, start banging the drum on this. And we can bring freedom and make life better for millions of people uh, so that all Algerians can worship in freedom and in, in the manner they see fit. But thank you so much for having me and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, why don't we go ahead and turn it over to uh, Dalia Ghanem, and, uh, a true Algeria expert uh, and from the region, if you could go ahead and, uh, and share your remarks. Yeah. Hi, everyone, and thank you for, ha for having me. Uh, so I'm going to try to contextualize all uh, the conversation and also to give some background on the religion uh, and its role in Algerian society, uh, because this is what it is about, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, so religion is an important component of the Algerian society and its identity. And actually, uh, you know, when uh, the decolonization process happened, and, and when Algerians started to fight uh, against French colonialism, they did it uh, uh, first in the name of uh, religion, even though it wasn't, uh, you know, it was to attract more people, but they did it in the name of the religion and they launched the, the jihad back then. And after 132, eight years of colonization, it was very important for the National Liberation Front, the FLN, to reappropriate the Algerian, the Arab, the Muslim identity. Uh, but Algerian society is deeply marked by the war of independence, but also by the violence that happened in Algeria in the 90s. And this is very important to talk about because even your report actually talk about that. Uh, you say it in your report that while it is true that uh, religious minorities are being uh, repressed and oppressed, the majority of the country, which is 99% of the population, which is Muslim Sunni, is also being being uh, oppressed. Um, so it is very important to keep in mind the, the, what happened in the 90s and the violence of the Islamic Salvation Front and all the jihadist group that mushroomed around the country during the 90s and that led to a civil war mainly between state, uh, the state and these jihadist groups that caused basically, uh, we talk about 200,000 uh, victims. So in the wake of the civil war, the Algerian government has succeeded is true in neutralizing the more extremist jihadist manifestation of political Islam by combining a soft and a hard approach. The authorities have paired a strong military presence on the ground to fight armed groups with conciliatory measures aimed at disarming, demobilizing, and reintegrating former extremists into society. But all that uh, to say is to say that because of this past, state control of Algeria's religious sphere in general and Islam in particular is substantial and pretty robust and tough. Uh, for instance, go back, I go back to Islam again. Official Islam has a powerful voice uh, through state institution, including ministers, inspectors, judges, scholars, and nothing is done without the approval, the approval of the state. State institution, for instance, control the management of property held by religious and charitable institution. No mosque basically can be built without the state uh, uh, acceptance. It goes, uh, you know, the same for, uh, you know, the prayer of uh, the uh, Friday, uh, you know, prayer. Um, for instance, also when, when mosques are constructed by the state, after the construction is completed, the state maintains control over many functional aspects, such as furnishing, maintaining, restoring, cleaning, guarding everything in the mosque. Imams, inspector, Habu's property attendant, they are all also, you know, managed by, uh, by the state. Uh, and civil servants are installed by the ministry and other bodies in charge of religious affairs. Um, for instance, the, the speech uh, of Friday, the Friday uh, prayer, uh, um, 
is never actually, uh, you know, uh, I want to say it as an imam told me once in Algiers, every dot and every comma uh, has, you know, to be uh, uh, under the guidelines uh, of uh, the state. Unauthorized imam are penalized and they risk fines and up to three years in prison. So this is just to say that it goes for the same, the same control uh, or the state has the same control on all uh, religions in Algeria, starting by Islam and going uh, through the other religion. More than ever, I want to say, today in Algeria, political thinking, the political thought, la pensée politique, power strategies and governance practices are deeply permeated by religion and they go hand in hand with the nationalization of the religious practice and of the Arabic language to create a unanimous identity. So this is what it is really about. It is more political than ever. And talking about that, it is very important to understand what's going on in Algeria right now, um, because the situation is really complicated. As you said, President Tabun is absent, he has been sick, but most importantly, we had a referendum on November 1st, and Algerians voted in a referendum for a series of of constitutional amendments proposed by the government and the referendum was a non-event because the low because of the low participation level and because more of that because of the legitimacy crisis that the Algerian government and the Algerian president are going through. So when we think about all these repression issues, we need to think about them in their totality, meaning it is religious uh, minorities, it is the majority, it is journalists, friends of mine, scholars are being jailed, and all this is deeply related to the politique, to the political. Why? Because the succession, and I am talking here about the succession, no a transition. There was no transition in Algeria. There was a succession. We went from the fifth, the fourth term of Abdelaziz Bouteflika to, as one protester said it, to the fifth term of Abdelaziz Bouteflika without Abdelaziz Bouteflika, with Abdel Majin Tiboun. The system find a way to regenerate itself and to protect the regime. And so the leadership today is going to put all means possible to maintain itself. And if it has to do with hand in hand, or I would say, if it has to do some acts in order to flirt, and I insist on flirt with some Islamist uh, parties or some conservative faction of the society in order to please them, they will do them. And I think this is what it is about. This repression of the minorities, it is to please some faction of the, uh, uh, the Islamists, you know, the, the political Islam in Algeria. They are flirting with them, saying, look, we are doing things in a way to please you, but also to please a part of the Algerian society that remains pretty conservative and also scared about what religious freedom can and religious identity can bring to Algeria. Because again, the Hirak, the popular movement of February 2020, uh, 2019, brought all these questions in the public space. What it is to be Algerian? Is it to be a Is it to, to be Arab? Is it to be Muslim? Is it to be sick? And all this discussion, I think many people, unfortunately, are not eager or willing to have because, again, difference, you know, difference is, is scary for many people. And again, the leadership is playing the same old tricks, which are we flirt with the Islamists to please them, to please the electorate. And so we can have voices in the next also legislative elections. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of insight there. And thank you to everyone who's with the opening remarks. I just wanted to remind everyone, uh, uh, attendees, that uh, if you uh, have a question, we've had a few already come in, so thank you. Uh, look at that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there and go ahead and uh, write your question uh, there and send it through. We'll get to those in just a few minutes. Uh, I did want to hit on your point uh, there regarding uh, the uh, role of Islamists, uh, and you, you talked about going back to the 90s when, of course, uh, there was the election and then the military kept the Islamists from coming to power. You know, fast forward, we saw, you know, uh, this law in 2006, which, as you said, I, I think, uh, Dahlia, that uh, it's the kowtow really to some of the Islamists. Uh, 
and nothing really happened for some years. And then we saw the Arab Spring come and Algeria, you know, the leadership there responded with some, uh, you know, cosmetic reforms, but maintained power, right, for all those years until last year. And so uh, I think our first question really I wanted to put out there is, you talked about Algeria now home to, to diverse array of civil society voices, and there's been some evolution with the various movements that have emerged this year uh, and last year. But how would we, anyone jump in for this, how could we characterize the state of domestic debate and rhetoric around religion, the role of religion and state and religious freedom? Is there a growing domestic support uh, for more of a separation. We see in Tun Tunisia, very unique, this separation, uh, you know, uh, emerging and gaining steam in recent years between religion and state. How would you characterize this in the Algerian context? And is there any sense of movement uh, with, uh, with some of these uh, protests and movements that are evolving? Anyone can jump in there. Would be happy to jump. Um, so I think again, the, you know, the, um, after the independence of the country, and this happened in many countries that, uh, you know, witnessed a long colonization, uh, you know, when you are, um, you are not allowed to practice your religion and to even speak your language for years, uh, the only way for you to reappropriate your identity is to go, I want to stay super radical about it. Let me, let me tell you, for instance, that my own parents are are francophone and they do not speak Arabic. Uh, they do not speak, uh, you know, classical Arabic. So when I am on Al Jazeera, for instance, all what my mother can say is, I find you very beautiful, but I didn't understand one word. Uh, so this is the post, you know, post independence generation that was totally deprived of its religion, of its identity, of its uh, language, even language they couldn't speak it. So of course, when the independence happened, the FLN, and the leadership they wanted, you know, and this is why in the constitution and in all constitution, you know, Islam is the religion of the state, Arabic is the official language, the Kabil, uh, the, the Amazigh had to fight for years and decades to have the Amazigh language brought up finally as the official language also. And still there are people who do not agree with that, even recently with the new constitution, many voices, notably the Islamists didn't agree with the fact that the Amazigh language is also the official language of the Algerian Republic. So that shows you that there is a debate out there. But again, many, many people, I, 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 don't, I don't have statistics because it's very hard to have figures in Algeria, but many people are scared of this question. It's not only because it is religion, because they are scared of all what can deviate from the real, between quotes, fight, which is the change of the regime. Same goes for feminist debate. Uh, and I was there in March and April 2019, and I was within the, the feminist carré uh, that they, uh, you know, during the, the demonstration, we have this feminist uh, quarter where we are all there, and I talked to them, and they were there, and they were very vocal about what they wanted. But again, the majority of people said, it is not about the time to debate about feminists and gender equality and the, the fight, the real fight needs to be focused now on the regime change and that's it. And I believe as a citizen, but also as a scholar, that this is a mistake. Because when women in 1962, they had the independence and they fought for independence like men, they've been told even the same. They said, no, go back to your kitchen for now. Thank you for what you did for the war of independence. But now real problems, we need to focus on them. So if we do the same mistake, then we are just delaying that. The religious problem, the identity problem, the cultural problem, and this also, we have to notice that in Algeria, we've been brought up, we grew up in an environment that love unanimity because the FLN, the leadership taught us that unanimity is, this is what we should be. 
We should all be Arabs, we should all be Muslim, and we should all talk Arabic. And this is, for instance, why there is a debate also between the Francophone and the Arabophone. And it is very enlightening to see when the FIS came into power, the first rows of the FIS were brought from the Arab, uh, the Arabic, uh, uh, the Arab speaker of the university. Why? Because when they went out of university after years of studying, they realized that actually the administration was still Francophone and the best jobs and the best position went to the Francophone elite. So this shock is still there, the identity, the culture, you know. Um, look all what happened during the demonstration about repression, by the way. My own brother was brought to jail because he held the Amazigh flag. So it's repression about all what doesn't fit within the box. So I, I, go ahead, uh, Commissioner. I, I, just to add uh, maybe two points. Uh, the, the first point is uh, for the purpose of USERF, you know, our, our, the benefit of USERF is we have an exclusive mandate, which is to focus on religious freedom conditions in countries uh, and often in countries as they are and as they as they exist. And so I, I feel like we should just uh, slide a caveat uh, that, that Yusuf's uh, uh, focus uh, um, isn't principally political. It's about the universal human right or the freedom of religion or the freedom to believe believe nothing at all. And uh, it, it is it is definitely the case that in all of these uh, all of these countries that we monitor, there are are many many multi layered and complex, often political factors that play into that equation. One of the things that we focus on intently, uh, and and I think I think my colleagues would agree on with me on this, is that religious freedom as a fundamental human right, or the freedom to not believe at all should even transcend all of these other political questions. We want change on this issue now. Now, with, with, you know, in the current situation, we want change now. We want people to do more to protect the, the, the freedom of religion and belief. I think just, a, uh, just a, a second general observation is, you know, unlike the neighboring countries like Tunisia and, uh, and Morocco, with robust tourism uh, sectors, uh, which, which sort of had the effect of, of bringing in lots of people from the outside uh, and, and injecting uh, at least an acquaintance with, with, with pluralism. Uh, you know, Al Algeria is not a country that, that has that, that level of interaction with the outside world. It's not a pri tourism isn't a primary sector in the, in the Al Algerian uh, economy. And I, I think that you know, while, while people in, in the region tend to default to solving these problems by religious means or by political means, I, you know, and, and, and now I'm getting a little bit outside of USERF's mandate, I think it's also very, very important that we focus on the broader, on the broader picture because uh, ha having, having uh, little, little exposure to, um, to, to, the, to the types of experiences that the neighboring countries have had uh, in, in many, many circumstances has, has limited the rate of possible change uh, in, in, in some of these areas and complicated the, the, the political factors. I just think that's an, uh, an observation worth, worth making. Yeah. Great, any, any other responses on that? Okay, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the other areas that uh, Dahlia mentioned in oh, I, her comments. I'm sorry, I was slow to jump in. I was muted. Oh, sorry, go right ahead. Yeah, I just want to tag team on those comments. I thought those comments were excellent. And uh, to, to Dahlia's point and to Johnny's point, the, it, the time is now. And it's not so much regime change because there's a hidden hand in Algeria. So we can have regime change and have the same result. Um, but I think the, the big push, uh, Dahlia's saying, is like, let's, let's push forward democracy. And women's rights and religious rights are potent forces to advance democracy. And you think about religious freedom, it's, you know, we, we all know what we're pushing for. It encompasses so many freedoms. It's uh, freedom of assembly, of thought, of conscience, conscience of speech, etc. So it's, 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 we don't want to devolve and say, no, we're only focused on regime change. The time is now, and it is for women's rights, religious freedom. It's for a greater democracy and expanding it in the region, not just Algeria, 
and is the answer to the to the whole region. So, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to you know turn turn a little bit of the attention to the kind of responses that uh, you all would recommend. I mean, in terms of uh, the situation we heard from Dahlia about a lot of the political uh, layers, but when we're looking at freedom of religion or belief um, and, the, and the unique nature in the region there, you know, Algeria uh, and, you know, I know France from the EU uh, plays an important role in terms of, uh, you know, relationships, but how can the U.S. and international community best uh, address the, the freedom of religion or belief component? Because so often you hear about the political context and you've, you've got to address it and push for reforms. But when we're looking at this, because of the complexities, um, what is the best way to approach this issue if we're urging uh, the international community or from the U.S. government perspective? Obviously, the U.S. has close relationships with a number of countries in the region, also has a relationship with Algeria. But what are some of the best ways to approach this issue, uh, to get traction and to cease some movement? Uh, you know, any, any, uh, any reflections would be welcome. I'll give a short one to begin the conversation. The first thing is the United States needs more engagement with Algeria. I mean, the United States is deeply engaged with many of the neighboring countries and, and not so engaged uh, with, with Algeria. And so I, I think, number one, that needs to take place. It needs to take place now and be a good partner of Algeria and start, start moving these things uh, forward. And then, and then secondly, you know, the, the, I, I think of change in concentric circles, this is sort of my personal opinion. You know, I, I, I am more interested in what can change in the circle that we're in now and seeing that circle naturally expand and forcing the circle to expand, you know, and breaking all kinds of other things along the way. So I, I'm sort of, I'm sort of looking at what's the next nearest change. And here's a good idea. If you have a commission, for non-religious groups, how about have a meeting? You know, how about approve something? Or how about open the churches up that were closed down again? Or the or the the Ahmadiyya uh, the, the community in Algeria, maybe abused more than any other other community, arbitrarily detained, you know, multiple people, you know, given given prison sentences, you know, in the last month. Like, stop it. You know, I mean, you, you have the power to, to do these things. And I, I think the world, and by the way, not just the United States, I, I think, the, I think the, the, the broader region needs to see right now that Algeria intends on being part of the solution and not part of the problem. And this plays into lots of other ha factors happening in Europe and, 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 in, and in other places around the world. I, there are plenty of things that could be done tomorrow here. The first of which is the US needs to engage more with this country and the second of which you know, the Algerian government, there's some very simple things that could be done tomorrow. They're choosing not to do because I think they think people don't notice, but we're noticing. Yeah, I think, I think also just for the administration, use the power of the bully pulpit. I mean, a few words go a long way. Now, Algeria is not the top of the geopolitical pecking order, but any uh, statements from the administration for any administration, we're going to move this thing a, lo a long way. Back channel communication is extremely important. That's what we've seen in the past. Um, and uh, we would love to see a champion in the EU. We'd love to see France's influence. Uh, we'd love to see him get engaged. But, you know, what, what are they doing with bombings in their own country against churches? So it's like, but I think that's where we have to, to sell. We have such a stake in uh, and, and belief in the moderating influence of religious freedom and how it's tied to democracy and to say, look, this is a stabilizing factor. We can all agree on this. Um, I think a lot of times, uh, you know, governments like Algeria in, in the back channel communications, they can have this conversation where <clears throat> they're saying, look, we have a very dangerous dog in our country and we're holding it back. And that dangerous dog would be radicalized Islam and, and terror. But that's not the issue here. I mean, it, it, it definitely forms the thinking in, in Algeria so distinctly but I think the, the big issue, the big dog that needs is the government. That's what needs to be held back. They are, they are the problem and democracy needs to be pushed forward and we just need to insist on it. And we could even you know, increase our aid, but tie it to it. It goes, a little goes a long way. We're not, we're not actually sending that much from what I can see to Algeria. Actually, we could increase it and just tie it. And I think you know, that and a few back channel communications would go a long way. Any other responses? Uh, I think, uh, yeah. go ahead. 
Uh, you know, I agree with you with the back channels and also soft diplomacy, but again, we need to keep in mind how the government, how the authorities, how this country, what is the history of this country. And again, this is a country that is pretty hermetic, pretty close, uh, with a leadership that is very jealous about its territorial integrity as much as the people. Algerians are very jealous about their territorial integrity and they are very proud people and any sign of interference can be seen as a negative. Just to give you a tiny example, of course, our relationship in Algeria with France has always been je t'aime moi non plus, I love you me neither. Uh, but look what happened when French President Emmanuel Macron, for instance, um, tweeted about the demonstration in the early March 2019. And I think he said something like, um, we, uh, we uh, stand with the Algerian people and also with President Putin. The, the, the Friday after that, I remember I was in Algiers and I was reading and taking pictures of the signs. And it was very, very interesting because people were writing there that Macron prepared, for instance, uh, one that uh, was uh, is still in my head, Macron prepared the wood because there will be no gas this winter meaning we are not going to, 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 to export gas and oil this, uh, this uh, winter. Or Macron, take care of your yellow vest, it's better for you. So just because of one tweet, Algerians were really reluctant about this, this they considered as foreign interference. But again, you need to come back to the history, but also to what's going on in the region. Every kind of interference, be it small or big, is a daily reminder for Algerians of what neighboring Libyan lived. And so they are very scared of this kind of situation. So this is why I do believe, and my best recommendation is, you know, back channels, but also maybe more cultural exchanges that will, uh, will you know, open uh, 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 negotiation for this kind of, of, of very sensitive, even taboo question in Algeria. Then the other thing that I do believe in is change from within. I do believe that change can come from my people. And here is the responsibility of the Hirak. The Hirak, the popular movement now, needs to take responsibilities about having a debate, be it on the local level and then on the regional, and then we will expect him to have it on the national level. But we need to talk now about this question. Just I advise you to go on Facebook pages, Algerians' Facebook pages, and you would see this kind of debate. Actually, there is no debate. There is only extreme voices that we do know. Majority of them are, we are Muslim, we are Arabs, and this is our identity and full stop. But there are fortunately other people who would say, no, we are much more, we are different, and we have to respect the difference of the, of the other. So I do believe that the, 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 the solution also needs to come from within. Thank you very much. Why don't we now turn to some of the audience questions. Again, uh, use that Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We've gotten several, so I want to get right to those and put those out uh, for our uh, panelists here. Um, we had a specific question that I wanted to bring out, and Commissioner Moore referenced it in terms of the Ahmadi community. Uh, we have a question saying that just Earlier this month, the government of Algeria apparently handed down a two-year prison sentences for Ahmadis in Constantine. In uh, Khanshala, Ahmadis have not been allowed to leave their town since 2017, and that's led to one member to suffer uh, severe mental health issues. And then just last month in October, the government announced a two-year prison sentence for its national president, the uh, Ahmadi national president and other members. More than 280 Ahmadis uh, face blasphemy charges what steps can be taken uh, to redress this uh, really uh, complicated and challenging issue? Vice Chair Bargaba. Sure, um, let me, let, th Amjad, thank you so much for the question. And I think in, in many ways, uh, part of the conversation we're having is what are the, the best ways for us to engage with the Algerian government on these issues? But I, I, I really uh, appreciate your raising what's happening to Ahmadi Muslims and other you know, Muslim minorities within Algeria in terms of, of, of continued uh, imprisonment and, and, and harassment 
Um, and so those are those are precisely this is this is the space that, as Johnny uh, Commissioner Moore mentioned earlier, this is precisely where it is that that USERF um, really wants to make sure that we are are highlighting and raising these kinds of concerns within the country. And so I would um, I would say a couple of things. I think from from USERF's perspective, uh, we can certainly uh, want to make sure that we're advocating. And, and I think you had a further question later on about due process and some of the length of, of prison sentences and the process that's going on uh, in terms of criminal justice. I think make sure that those who are or are, um, are, are being imprisoned um, due to their faith or due to the practice of their faith or defending it or, or advocating in a, in, a, in a journalistic context, that those are, those are places that we can um, certainly take up uh, the, the mantle and, and, and try and push for, um, for, for change in that regard. And, and secondly, I think it's, it's uh, really important for us to continue to highlight uh, what is happening to um, a, you know, a, a wide range of communities within, within the country um, and, to, and, to, and to make sure that we're not, we're not missing um, the ways in which um, some of these divides are, are playing out uh, within within local communities and also within the, the the Muslim community at large. And so, thank you very much for for raising it. I think um, there's uh, and, and let me just say one more thing. We we have long been focused on the ways in which uh, blasphemy laws um, have impacted um, the practice of faith, and uh, and we'll be coming out uh, with yet another report highlighting that in December, and um, and want to make sure that as you mentioned. Those who are in prison on, on blasphemy charges or are facing them are, are ones that we, you know, are, are, are again those that we are advocating for and highlighting uh, the ways in which those laws um, are ones that you know should not be part of any kind of government regulatory and legal regime um, or framework. And we will continue to push to make sure that um, that that they're not, you know, they're not used in the way that that as you mentioned they are being used currently. So. Um, thank you for, for, for sharing. And, if, and, and I'll just say, if you can please continue to uh, reach out to USERF with any of that kind of information about what's happening in the Amani community, I think it would be very, very important for us to, to, to partner with you and others um, in, in highlighting that. Thank you. Any other reactions to that specific question? Uh, just to add a, a simple point, and that is uh, that USERF is really proud to be among the foremost advocates for the the rights of the uh, Ahmadi community around the world and we intend on s staying that way and you know it's it's easy for a big bright light to be shown upon uh the evangelical protestant community in Nigeria because there's 700 million evangelicals around the world uh but but you don't believe in religious freedom uh, at all, unless you believe in religious freedom for all, uh, and and this community is is perhaps persecuted certainly as much, if not more, than any community uh, in anywhere in the world. And uh, I, I just reiterate what Vice Chair Bargava said. You know, keep giving us the information, uh, and we'll we'll keep we'll keep shining shining a light on it. We can't always stop this stuff, but what we can do is make sure that it can't be done in the shadows quite so easily. I think it's important to, I'm just, I'm just going to kind of echo what everyone else has said. Um, <clears throat> but I think USERP has done such a great role with uh, standing up for Muslims. So you look at the Muslims in China or the Ahmadis, and I think it's really important in the religious freedom community. We, we really own this. It's not always, uh, um, you know, out in the populace as a whole, in the evangelical populace as a whole, it's not always as well understood, but we have to stand up. As Johnny said, it's religious freedom for all, or it doesn't work. And so we really, we really need to see um, <clears throat> the culture inside needs to see this as a push for democracy. It's a push for greater toleration e everywhere. Uh, so it's not just a wedge. It's not being used as a, our push is not a wedge for from the West to open it up to Christianity. It's just to let people believe what they believe. And just like you want the Muslims in China to be free, you know, uh, or the Ahmadis. It's just a, it's it's a tolerance and freedom and different cultures are going to take uh, a longer time to see that. But that's, I think, I think we do a good job internally having that discussion and presenting that. And we always need to be on the forefront of making people understand that. Great. Thank you. There's a, there's a few questions that I'll pull together here that really, uh, you know, for Dahlia's view, but also 
uh, Jeff and Commissioner Moore and Vice Chair Bargaba around kind of Christians. So one question is, are you optimistic about the role that the Amazigh nationalism uh, has to play with conversions to Christianity among Algerians uh, in that context? But also, how can the international community support voices calling for religious freedom in the country? For example, Christians have documented how the Algerian police closed the churches and many of those involved in the protests call for a secular country and the rights of women, similar to things you heard in say Sudan, or, or do average Algerians support the church, church closures and a religious state? Where do we have a sense of the, 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 the popular sentiment around uh, these closures and is there support beyond just the community itself to take up the mantle? We've seen that in many countries in the region. You know, as Jeff says, you know, when, when you have these coalitions calling for the rights of other religious minorities, it's very powerful and heard even much more strongly in the leadership that it's not just the minority, right? It's a citizenship right for all people. So if you could address the issue of the Amazigs and that movement and uh, conversions to Christianity, as well as uh, the kind of support there might be for for the uh, Christian community in Algeria beyond the community itself. Yeah, I think what the Amazigh community between quotes or the Berber hinterland did throughout the Algerian history is amazing. And today reaching the point where the Amazigh language is recognized in the Algerian constitution is a beautiful and a big uh, step because uh, let's let's face it. I mean, repression and oppression happened against you know uh, these people for decades, and of course, everybody keep in mind the Berber Spring, and everybody keep in mind what happened in two thousand one. Uh, but again, we need to remember um, how the strategies of uh, how the government played always the Amazigh card as being you know the mean bad people who want their independence, who want to be Christianized who do not belong to the nation. Uh, and hence, you know, we have in this media, in the local media, this uh, demonization of, of uh, the Amazigh and the Amazigh identity, while fortunately today, this doesn't work anymore. The proof is that in, when the Hirak broke up and took up to the street in 2019, people were saying, I am Amazigh, I am Tuareg, I am Arab, I'm, I am Kabil, I am from all over. Algeria, I am Algerian. So that shows that finally the card that they use, this old dirty trick when they used to say, oh, this is a Kabil problem, is no longer the case. And what is also very enlightening is to see how the Algerians kept in mind the experience of the 2001 um, uh, appraising in Kabilia for today's Hirak. For instance, the question of the leadership of the popular movement in Algeria is deeply related to what happened in the Berber hinterland in 2001. Why? Because Algerians kept in mind that back then the Berber hinterland were able to organize themselves and to choose a leadership to their movement called al Arush, and it is this Arush who was able to uh, negotiate and to bring the question of identity and language to the table of negotiation and finally to have its recognition. But unfortunately the Arush movement was co-opted by the government and by the authorities and so it dissolved, but it dissolved also mainly because of internal um, conflict between the leadership. And so, for instance, the Hirak today doesn't want to have a leadership. It's a leaderless movement because it kept in mind what happened to the Amazigh in 2001. So I think we are learning from each other. And I think what is very, very important today is two point. Uh, one, we have the Amazigh language, which is part of our identity and history in the institution. My mother speak fluent Amazigh and I was brought up, you know, with this language as much as French and Arabic. So I am very happy and proud to have it in the constitution and uh, to have kept it as a matter of fact. And uh, the second point is that today, finally, the Algerians are aware that this demonization of the other, this othering process is not going to work, at least not on the ethnic identity. So what they are going to do is try it on the religion side. 
And here we are closing churches and we are closing, uh, you know, in 2015 or 2016, I wrote a, 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 a good length article called State on the Islam in, in Algeria, in which I was ex explaining how the control of Islam and uh, uh, official religion was very tight and robust in Algeria. And just to give you a tiny example, in 2015, the Algerian government reportedly closed 900 legal and unrecognized mosque and he closed also 50 additional mosques because of security concerns about their Salafi nature. So this is really against, you know, uh, this uh, desire to control the religion but could, to control also the minds of the people. This is what you should believe in and this is how you should believe in. This is, for instance, it, it is very enlightening, you know, to see that um, imams who do not for instance, enter within the ranks and, for instance, call the people for votes and so on and so forth, have troubles with the authorities. Uh, so again, I think we can expect more of this closing. This is again a dirty political trick, you know, to to gain also legitimacy. Let's let's be honest about it. They are so. I, I mean, their historical legitimacy died. Uh, they are dying biologically, and their political legitimacy uh, legitimacy is very meager. So what is left there to garn, you know, to garner? a bit of legitimacy. Well, let's play on the identity religious issue and let's pit people against each other. Um, and the, on, uh, on, there was another question or I addressed part of that. Yes, about if there's support for the community that has the church closures, or there's, is there any support among any human rights group or other entities for, uh, to, to highlight this and to speak out against uh, those closures? And is there support in the society uh, for, you know, freedom of religion or belief to allow other uh, faith communities like the uh, evangelical Christian community to, to, to function, to, to simply have their places of worship and let them function. You know, I think we should have more figures and statistics in Algeria, but unfortunately we don't have enough of these. So I don't know what are, you know, the figures, but I can, you know, it is very hard to know what the ordinary Algerian citizen think, but I would think that the Algerian citizen, you know, the, you know, ordinary one is pretty conservative. Uh, so, you know, I am not sure that, you know, it will be touched by, you know, church being closed or, you know, people being put in jail because they are not, you know, um, following the faith of Islam or because they, uh, I, 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 I can say, unfortunately, this is the, not a conversation that people are, are willing to, to to have, you know, for instance, every Ramadan, we hear about these people being put in jail for a few hours because they broke or they do not simply, they do not fast. And again, go on Facebook, go on, go on Twitter and see, I think this is good metric to see the opinion of the random citizen, you know, and you will see the hatred message for me personally. It's, uh, I can't understand this. People are, again, pretty conservative about how the Algerian identity should be. This is why I think, I believe, it is the role of the Hirak to have at least these local, you know, local conversation locally, to have them locally and then regionally about what 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 do we want what do we expect we are in 2020 we are on the eve of 2021 algerians should have the right to believe or not to fast or not to pray or not and state control of religion has its limit you know it's super counterproductive let's 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 be honest about it when you close let's say 10 churches let's say you have 30,000 people praying in these churches. You close 10 churches, but you have 30,000 others opening because you have 30,000 people praying in their house and calling each other to, to pray. So it is super counterproductive. Uh, let, let us be smart about it. Let us have a conversation. And I do believe again that back channels are the only way to do it, but also internally, you know, between the Hirakis and the Algerian citizens. Yeah, back, Thank back. you so much. Inside. Let, let me uh, just go ahead and we, we've run up against time, but I do want to give Commissioner Moore and Jeff King about 60 seconds apiece to go ahead. Any final comments, if you can do it in that allotted time, starting with Commissioner Moore, if that's okay. 
Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take my 60 seconds to uh, answer Father uh, Bramwitz's question about the UAE, uh, Israel, Sudanese, Israel normalization. Uh, let me just say, uh, one of the unique characteristics of all three of those agreements, including the Bahraini one, is in the first paragraph of the agreements, uh, it, it is uh, religious freedom is enshrined in the first paragraph of the agreement. So the agreement isn't just about the normalization of the relationship between Israel and the countries. Uh, it's about the uh, it's about an agreement uh, more broadly uh, as to as to how how these countries are to to uh, behave with one another and what they're to promote in the world. It's a bit of what I was alluding to when I said the momentum is moving in the right direction. Now, would I expect Algeria to be the next one? I probably expect Morocco, which has a a very large Jewish population and if discreet, long amicable relationship with the Jewish community. Uh, long, long before Algeria, but I think Algeria's leaders ought to look Israel aside. They ought to look very, very closely that when the world is moving in one direction, uh, including the Arab world, they should be moving uh, in, not, not in, an, in an opposite direction. And I'll take my last 10 seconds to say, uh, as Dahlia was speaking, it reminded me of an experience when I was in college, like, you know, more than 10 years ago. I was visiting Lyon in a small little church and an elderly a Berber woman came up to me. She must have been 90. And she, a small little lady, and she comes up to me and she, uh, she was, uh, had, had, had dementia, but she thought I was her son. And I will never forget, never forget that moment of sitting there and praying with this, this dear Christian woman. Uh, and, and for her, she just thought I was, I was her, her son. And so I, I hadn't thought of that memory in a very, very long time, but I just wanna thank you for bringing it back to me in, in our conversation. Yeah, I would say, Dahlia, I think, nailed it. But in, in trying to think, to your point, look, the explosion of the evangelical movement and the Berbers, and now moving beyond, is a real hidden and potent force in this, in everything we're seeing, as well as the historical context with the war with the radicals. But um, <clears throat> I, I would say just, I would echo just what Dahlia was saying. Look, this makes no sense. And dictators and despots and others never learn you are, by closing down the churches, you're throwing gas on the fire. All you're doing is sending, spreading that out. Instead of centralizing, you're spreading it out and starting many churches, thousands and thousands of house churches. It doesn't make logical sense for, for these leaders to do this. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, uh, we've, we've run up uh, against the hour we had, and we're a little over. Uh, but I definitely want to thank both of our commissioners. Uh, Vice Chair Bargava had to jump off for another uh, event. Uh, thank her and also Commissioner Johnny Moore, uh, as well as uh, Jeff King and Dahlia Ghanem uh, for all the insights. We, it sounds like we were just getting the discussion going. Very insightful. Uh, but I also want to thank uh, uh, USERF policy analyst Madeline Belturo, uh, who covers Algeria, who uh, helped uh, with this event quite a bit, and also USERF staffers Thomas Kramer and Nina Ulam, who uh, contributed to this event. If you'd like to learn more about USERF's work on Algeria, I encourage you to visit our website at www.usurf.gov. And we look forward to hosting similar conversations on other countries and issues in the months ahead. Thank you again for tuning in today, and we'll see you next time on USERF Conversations. Have a good day.